Looks like it is time to begin. So let's pray and get into our topic for this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for this day that you have made, for uh, the wonders of your creation, and for the time that we can spend together. Thank you for all that you have done and that you continue to do. Open our eyes and help us to see the truth that sets us free. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you are, you've seen this before. Uh, there's some things that have been added to it in preparation for camp meeting because our camp meeting is going to be on relationships and camp meeting whew, is in a less than a week and a half. So we've got just a little bit of time to go and a lot of preparation to do before that time. Lord knows and he'll work it out. So sphere of action, what is sphere of action? It's important to define, to define what we're talking about. So sphere of action is the actions of self-government for which the individual and no one else is responsible. So there you go. It's in the context of self-government. If there was no self-government, there would be no sphere of action. And in the context of self-government, it is what I have a responsibility for that nobody else has a responsibility for, for me. And God also has a sphere of action, and his sphere of action includes everything outside of an individual's sphere of action. So everything that's outside of your own sphere of action and somebody else's sphere of action, that is God's sphere. And when we look at sphere of action, of course, God has a sphere of action where he is in control and he takes responsibility for everything that happens in his sphere of action. But he has created intelligent creatures <clears throat> with their own sphere of action. And, and that sphere of action is each individual's own where they have their self-government and they have their own individual responsibility for that self-government in their sphere of action. And God, since he has created individuals with that sphere of action, God takes no responsibility for somebody else's sphere of action. He takes no responsibility for what uh, others do with their own sphere and how they manage their own sphere, that is not his responsibility. Now, <clears throat> if we want to get specific, and we, we do, and we want to get relatively specific, uh, my sphere of action exists in the mind. It is a function of the spirit. It's not a function of the body. And it's the mind or it's the spirit that cannot be forced but the body can be forced. The body can be arrested, put in handcuffs, thrown in prison, uh, made to do things that <clears throat> um, from the outside, it can be controlled from the outside and uh, injured and damaged from the outside. But the spirit is created to control itself from the inside and never be controlled from the outside. The spirit cannot be forced. It can, <clears throat> what should I say? Individuals can... coerce. Uh, individuals can uh, bring information. Individuals can torture the body. And they can do things of that nature in order to try to get the consent of the mind or the consent of the spirit. Uh, but it can't force that to happen. <clears throat> so when we have two individuals with their sphere of action, I have no responsibility for somebody else's sphere of action. And that's important for us to recognize. Even as a parent, I don't have a responsibility for the sphere of action of my child. If I am an adult with uh, aging parents, I don't have a, a responsibility for their sphere of action. I have no responsibility for anybody else's sphere of action. 
I am only responsible within my own sphere, not in their sphere. And their sphere of action includes completely what they think and what they believe. That is completely within their sphere of action. And so I have no responsibility for what somebody else thinks and what somebody else believes. Now, what an individual says and what they do comes or initiates inside their sphere of action, but that does not remain within their sphere of action. <clears throat> that eventually comes out into common space. And once it comes out into common space, then that is not the individual's sphere of action. That is now God's sphere of action. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. So <clears throat> what I think, what I believe, or what somebody else thinks and what somebody else believes, that's their own responsibility. What they choose, that's their own responsibility. And what they initiate in saying and doing, that's their own responsibility, not mine. And God as well does not get into my sphere of action and he does not get into anybody else's sphere of action. He will not intrude into someone else's sphere of action. That is not his sphere of action. He created us with our own sphere. He does not interfere in our own sphere of action. Um, <clears throat> so there is a law of cause and effect. And that law of cause and effect assures us that every good cause produces a good effect and every bad cause produces a bad effect. And that's important because we very we can clearly see effects, but we don't see causes very well. You take a hose and you connect it to the faucet, you don't see the taking happening because it's it's covered, it's it's closed. But you can see the effect when the water comes out the other side of the hose. The effect it becomes clear while the cause is not very easy for us to ascertain. We ascertain the cause based upon the effect that comes from it. So <clears throat> that being true, it's also true that God has promised that all things work together for good to those who love God and that nothing will be too much for us. First Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation, trial, suffering, and so on has overtaken you except such as is common to men, but God's faithful will not allow you to be tied, tr uh, tried, tested, tempted, tortured beyond what you were able, but with that thing will provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So that is true. So the law of cause and effect says that every good cause produces a good effect, every bad cause produces a bad effect. But all things work together for good to, the, to those who love God, and nothing will be too much for us. So therefore, God must intervene in the context of sin by limiting the negative effects so that he can assure that all things work out for good. But if God limited all negative effects, then we would never be able to understand that there is a bad cause. In place, right? if, God, if God never allowed a bad effect to come, then we would never know that there was a bad cause there and never have any motivation to do anything about it. So he must allow negative effects to come from negative causes or bad effects to come from bad causes. But in order to work all things out for good and that nothing is too much, he must limit that. He must dampen it. He must filter it. Everyone <clears throat> is free to self-govern within their own sphere of action. You are free to think and believe and to trust and to choose and so on for yourself. That is yours and you can, you can play in your own territory all you want to. You have freedom there. But no one is free to speak or to act without God's intervention. Because you are speaking and you are acting by God's power. And when you say something, that comes out into God's sphere of action. And when you do something, that comes out into God's sphere of action. And what somebody else thinks, what they believe, what they trust, what they choose, that is the cause. What is coming from the sphere of action of an individual is the cause. 
what they actually say or do is the effect. And God has no responsibility for the cause. He has no responsibility for what somebody thinks, what they believe, what they choose, and so on. And he never attempts to control the cause. He never attempts to get into somebody else's sphere of action. But he does take responsibility for the law of cause and effect because he's the creator of it. And he does control the effects for the purpose of working out good in the context of sin. Outside of the context of sin, there is no need for God to intervene at all. There's, there's no need for intervention because everything functions as it was created. The intervention is only needed in the context of sin. Now, what happens? Well, <laughs> things happen when it comes to spheres of action. And one of the things that happens in spheres, spheres of action is that a lot of times you and I we try to get out of our own sphere and we try to control what is in God's sphere. So we start trying to control time and space and environment and circumstances and resources and people and finances and you name it. All of these things that are outside of us, we, do, we try to control our own health outcomes and uh, exposures to uh, toxins and other things of that nature. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have a responsibility for how you interact and relate to things, but you do not have any responsibility for what you cannot control, and you cannot control anything that's outside of you. Not only do we try to get out into God's sphere and control the things that are in his control, but we also try to get into somebody else's sphere and control what they think and what they believe and what they choose and what they say and what they do, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a tendency in our sinful fallen human nature to get out of our sphere and to go dabbling in others' spheres. Righteous self-government, like a normal cell, stays within its own sphere of action. If you are governing according to righteousness, you will stay in your own sphere. Sinful self-government or selfish self-government, like a cancerous cell, tries to get outside of its sphere of action into somebody else's sphere. So if I am a creature, but I believe that I am God, then automatically I'm going to be selfish. My motives are going to be wrong, and I'm going to try to control things outside of my sphere of action. Now, remember, one of the fruits of the Spirit has the word control in it, but it's to control what? Well, some versions say temperance. Is temperance controlling someone else, or is it controlling you? It's self control. Fruit of the Spirit is self-control. When you have the Spirit and you are responding to the influence of the Holy Spirit, the truth, you are taking it in and you are operating and self-governing according to the truth. You will govern yourself. You will control yourself in your sphere of action, and you will leave that alone with others. Selfishness has boundaries for itself. It's always trying to self-protect, but it doesn't have boundaries for others. Meaning, I will try to keep somebody out of my sphere of action, but I freely try to enter into others' sphere of action. And I try to keep them out of my space, but I freely enter into theirs. And when I try to get out of my sphere of action into somebody else's, or they try to get out of their sphere of action into mine, the result of that is going to be conflict. And when I try to get out of my sphere of action into God's and try to control what is only under God's control, the result of that is stress. So conflict and stress are always related to this topic of sphere of action. So, when you have two individuals that have freedom to govern themselves, when I try to get into somebody else's sphere of action, 
they are going to resist that intrusion because they were created to govern themselves. They were not created to be governed from the outside. They were created to govern themselves from the inside. So when I try to get into their sphere of action, they're going to resist me intruding into their sphere of action. And my trying to get where I'm not supposed to be and them resisting me being where I'm not supposed to be, that's going to result in conflict. That's where conflict comes from. Again, one person trying to get into somebody else's sphere and resisting that intrusion and vice versa, them trying to get into my sphere and resisting that. And then there's the conflict that comes from there. The reality is that I can actually never get into somebody else's sphere of action. I, I have no power to do so. I have nothing that allows me and that permits me to actually get into somebody else's sphere of action. And somebody else can never actually get into my sphere of action. It's impossible. It can't happen. But it sure seems like. And the question is, what's going on when it sure seems like? it? If somebody else has acceptance and approval and harmony and security and companionship and these various different things, at least I perceive that they have these things that I need. And I see them as the source of what I need. Then what I'm going to do is I am going to bind myself to them so that I might receive from them the acceptance, the approval, the harmony, the security, and so on. Whatever I perceive they control and they possess that I need, that I'm going to bind myself to them so that I might receive those things from them. Now, seeing them as the source of what I need, I am going to modify how I think, how I speak, how I act in harmony with what I believe they want so that I can still receive from them the acceptance and the approval and the harmony and so on. Why do I... So it appears that they are getting into my sphere of action because it's modifying how I think, it's modifying how I speak, it's modifying how I act. But they are not the one that's modifying how I think because they can't ever control what I think. They are not the ones that are modifying what I say and what I do because they can never initiate what I say and what I do. It's only me that can do that. So they're not actually getting into my sphere of action at all. Although to me, it feels like it because I'm living by a lie. I'm living by a self-deception. And in that self-deception, while I, the creature, believe that I am God, I see others as my source of love and all of the aspects of love. And so I bind myself to them. I make them my source. And as long as I think that they possess something that I need, I will bind myself to them and I will modify my behaviors, my thoughts, and so on in association with what I believe they want so that I can continue to receive those things from them. So really, the problem is in myself and the problem is completely in myself. And it's according to the lie, it's according to the deception that I react this way, but in my deception, it I think that they are the one that's getting into my sphere of action. When it's reality, it's me that is redirecting or re, uh, what should I say? I am self-governing differently because of the delusion and what I perceive in relation to that delusion.
So do you ever feel pressured? Well, if I'm pressured by someone, then I believe that they have something that I need. Or I believe that they can do something to me that I don't want. So because I fear losing what I need, or I fear being forced to do what I don't want to do, I now feel under pressure. So that's where the pressure comes from. But when we know that only God controls what we need, he's the source of it, not anybody else. And when we know that no one can do anything to us except by God's permission, and when we know that anything that God permits, he only permits it because it will work out for good, then where's the pressure? There isn't. The pressure only comes because of my own perception, my own belief in a lie that they control what I need or they can harm me. The moment I recognize they don't control anything that I need, only God does, and they cannot harm me unless God says, okay, and then that harm is going to work out for good. So is it really harm? then there's no pressure. Now, when somebody thinks and they believe and they say and they do, well, again, the thinking and the believing is totally within their sphere of action. But the saying and the doing comes out into common space. Now, I have absolutely no responsibility for what they think and what they believe. I have absolutely no responsibility for what they say and what they do. None whatsoever. But the moment that I take responsibility for what they think and what they believe, the moment that I take responsibility personally for what they say and what they do, now I'm going to start trying to control what they think and what they believe, what they say and what they do. I'm going to start getting into their sphere of action. And of course, that's going to cause conflict. And it's going to result in damaged relationships as well. The moment I start taking responsibility for somebody else's thoughts, for somebody else's beliefs, for what they say, what they do, how they govern themselves, you're in trouble. We're in trouble. Of course, we live in a context of space that's outside of us, time that's outside of us, circumstances and resources and environment and people and possessions, all of these things that are outside of us. And we see all of these things as problems, especially when it's not working well, when the, the finances are ooh, dwindling, when the possessions are stolen or burned up when the people are not behaving the way that you thought they should, when the environment is too hot or too cold, too dry, too wet, the social environment is too loud, too angry, too whatever. The circumstances are, are not right. Uh, we had a church member that had a fairly serious car accident today. You know, those were difficult circumstances. They're in the hospital right now. And... Um, and so we're praying for them, but those are difficult circumstances. And can you control that? No. Can you control time and space? No. None of these things you can control. And all of these threaten to burn you. They threaten to burn you up. And so here we are trying to control all of these things that are outside of us in order to keep them from burning us up. And it's stressful trying to control all of the things that you can't control. And when you are threatened to get burned up, and you think that you're being threatened to be burned up, well, it's stressful. So stress, is, again, is where I get off of my, you know, I get off of my path, and I get into God's path, and I start trying to control all the things that are under his control. Well, that results in stress. Now, what somebody says and what they do, that doesn't just stay in their sphere. That goes places. That influences other it has an influence on others and while i have no responsibility for what they say and what they do if i believe that i am god 
But again, I'm a selfish God, uh, the creature thinking that they're God. If I believe that I am God, then I take responsibility for what they say and what they do, and now I try to control them in relation to what they say and what they do. Hmm. Not my sphere, but now I try to make it my sphere. And now I take personal what they say and what they do. And if they say something to me and they do something to me, I take it personal as if it's about me because now in my I am God state, I'm thinking that I should be able to control what they say and what they do. And so now, now I take personal what they say and what they do. When in reality, what they say and what they do comes from their own sphere. It's about them. It's not about me. Even if they say it to me, even if it's directed at me, even if they throw the punch at me, it's about them because it came from them. It's not about me. It didn't come from me. But taking it personal, that came from me. That came from me because it's my own delusion. It's my own deception that now thinks that what they do is my responsibility and now I take responsibility for it. I take it personal because they're not acting right. And I try to control them. Welcome to parenting. In fact, welcome to all relationships. <laughs> so does God get into somebody else's sphere of action? No, never. Does God take responsibility for what somebody else does in their sphere of action? No, never. He doesn't take responsibility for what I think, what I say. I mean, what I what I think, what I believe, what I choose, where I put my trust and faith and so on. Yeah, God takes no responsibility for that. That's mine. So he is not responsible there in our self-government. That's our own responsibility. But, hmm, <clears throat> if that's the case... And he doesn't intrude in somebody else's sphere of action. And there's a problem inside of somebody's sphere of action. How's God going to fix the problem? If it's where he has no responsibility, and it's where he has no control, and it's where he will not intrude. It's like a mechanic with no arms. Imagine with me that you're off in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, there's snow around here. So let's just imagine this is Alaska. And you've been on an Alaskan tour uh, by yourself in your vehicle. And you've been driving around all over the place. And you, somewhere you get out there and it's hundreds of miles between different places, sometimes thousands of miles between some form of life and the next form of life that you can relate to and talk to. And you break down, and you're a car. You don't. You're not a mechanic. You don't know vehicles. It just broke down, and you happen to be within a half a mile of a few houses. And in one of those houses, there happens to be a mechanic. Unfortunately, a few seasons ago. That mechanic ran into a polar bear, and the polar bear happened to leave him with a, a quick weight loss program and removed his arms. He survived, of course. And here he is. He has all of the knowledge, and he has the experience of a mechanic, but he doesn't have the arms of a mechanic anymore. So you need help. And so you, how is this situation going to be resolved? You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to fix it. You don't have any tools. He has the tools, but he doesn't have the arms to do anything with. But he's got the knowledge. So the two of you can work on fixing your car. You will use your hands and your arms, and he will use his mind and his knowledge of the situation. And you do the work, and you pick up the tools, and you use them, and he guides you, and he directs you, and he diagnoses the problem, and so on. And with the two of you working together, you can fix the problem and get on your way. 
it's a similar type of thing when it comes to our sphere of action. Now, some might ask the question, well, do you mean that God doesn't have any arms? Well, the problem is inside of our own sphere of action, and God has no arms inside of our sphere. That's not his space. So only we can actually work directly on the problem. Spirit of Prophecy says that the expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. It's the act of the soul itself to expel sin. It's not God reaching in and removing the sin. There's an, another analogy that's used, and that is that God is knocking on the door. Christ is knocking on the door. And he's seeking for entrance, but the door is cluttered. It's cluttered with stuff, and we don't get to the door because we have all this stuff in front of the door. Well, whose responsibility is it to clear away the clutter so that you can get to the door? It's your own. It's not God's responsibility. But we don't know how to fix the problem, and we don't have the power to fix the problem. That's our problem. We're the ones that need to do the work, but we don't have the know-how, and we don't have the power. So God offers to guide us. He offers to empower us, but we are the ones that must do the work with his power and under his direction. And so if we wait for him to do the work, nothing's going to work because he can't reach in there and do the work. And if we rely upon ourselves to fix it, well, that's not going to work either because we don't have the knowledge and we don't have the power. So it's only as we work together with God, him guiding, him empowering, us following and doing the actual work, that the problem inside of our sphere of action can be fixed. It's the only way that it can be fixed. Now, if you have two individuals that are in the I am God state, sinful fallen human individuals, which is the usual case that we run into. Now, this one says something and this one does something and they have a responsibility for what they say and do. Who is their responsibility to? It's not to the other person. Their responsibility is to God because they are created by God. They belong to God. So their accountability is to God. What they say and what they do now enters into common space. And while God has no responsibility for what happens in the individual's own sphere of action, and while God controls nothing that happens inside of an individual's sphere of action, God does take responsibility for what happens in common space. And he does control what happens in common space. So God will never control what this individual thinks. He will never control what they believe. He will never control what they say. He will never, I mean, what they, what they choose. That's what I meant to say. He will never control what they choose. He will never control what they determine to say and what they determine to do. But God can and will control whether they can actually say it and whether they can actually do it or not. And he can control the effects of it. They might say it and they might do it. I might not hear it. And so it might not affect me. Or it might whiz by me and it didn't hit me. You know, God can work in common space from that standpoint. So God, <clears throat> he gives his power to his creation through predictable laws. Everything operates according to law, including fire. Fire operates by whose power? Well, by God's power. There's only one power that fire operates by. It's by God's power. But God gives his power to fire through the channels called laws. His power is given to his creation for it to function through channels called laws. And laws are predictable. And so his power is given to fire through predictable laws and fire only burns what it burns by the power of God. But the power of God is given a fire through law. But God is not limited to that or bound by that, and God can intervene, as was the case with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. 
there was fire. And yes, that fire burned and people died. How did they burn and how did they die? It was by God's power through fire that they, they died. Yes, it was given to that fire through predictable laws, but God so chose to limit that power in the case of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Similar with Daniel's case, those lions only live by the power of God. They only act with the power of God. That's the only way that they can do so, because there's only one source of power. But God gives that power to lions through predictable laws. And they have a certain uh, they have a certain personal action and so on that they conduct. But in this case, God limited that for the sake of preserving Daniel because he knew this needed to work out for good. And so he intervened in that case to work it out for good. He does so with men. Here's a prophet sent to King Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the one that took the ten tribes away from Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the grandson of David. <clears throat> and Rehoboam had said, well, my father, he, you know, people were, the old men were telling him, uh, the old advisors of the kingdom, when Rehoboam became the new king after Solomon, they were saying, well, be nice to the people. Solomon's been really hard on them. You need to be nice to the people and you'll keep them with you. They'll be loyal to you. But if you're hard on them, they'll go. And they, he turned to the young advisors and the young advisors said, bah, uh, you be a big man. Right? Tell them what you're going to do. If your father, my, you know, tell them that my father was like my pinky finger and I'm going to be a big man and I'm going to do more and worse to you than my father did. And so he told Israel that, and Jeroboam along Jeroboam along with ten tribes of Israel said, no, nah, nah, not us, we're going. And so the northern tribes of Israel separated from, <clears throat> from uh, the two lower tribes, Judah. And, um, and so anyway, so one of the things that Jeroboam did is he set up false altars, <clears throat> alternate places of worship in the northern kingdom, as opposed to what God set up in the southern kingdom. And so that the people wouldn't go down there to worship and then reconcile back with the, with the southern tribes and, and so on. So this prophet was sent to Jeroboam to curse the altar on which he made these sacrifices and to give him a prophecy <clears throat> that a descendant of David sometime down the line by the name of Josiah would <clears throat> burn the priest's bones on that altar and destroy it completely. And that was a few hundred years down the line. Well, Jeroboam was not happy with that announcement, and he said, arrest that man. And when he did so, his, his arm wither, wither, withered up. And it withered up, and he wasn't able to bring it back to himself. Why? Because it wasn't his arm. It was God's. It wasn't his power. It was God's power. And while God never intervened in what Jeroboam believed and what he thought and what he intended to do, God intervened in what Jeroboam could actually accomplish. And God said, no, no. <clears throat> you don't have access to that power anymore. And he couldn't move his arm. <clears throat> and bullets move by the power of God. Through predictable laws. And when it God knows that it is fit to do so, he intervenes in ways that are working things out for good and making sure things are not too much. And in this particular story, some of you have heard me tell it, some of you have not. When I was uh, at Loma Linda University and doing my medical school training, I went on the trauma team. And as part of the trauma team, I had the privilege 
of hearing a story that had happened just a couple of weeks before that the team was really still excited about, and that was a young woman who was shot in the head. She had broken up with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend didn't think that was the best idea. And so he came, and while she was stopped at a red light in town, he came up and pulled a pistol and shot her in the head. Of course, she was in the driver's seat, So, and this is America, so it went through the left temple, and it came out this side of her head. And, and then, of course, he ran off. And 911 emergency services were called, and they rushed her to the trauma center there at Loma Linda. And, of course, the team was working quickly to try to stabilize her and one of the first things they needed to do after the initial stabilization was to get her to the CAT scanner to find out what actually happened in the brain so that they could talk to the neurosurgeon to see what might need to be done in relation to this injury to see if it's survivable and what can be done to help her to survive. And if you've ever been in CAT scan or radiology department, you know that what happens is it's a it's kind of a tube that you're in and it kind of swirls around you and it shoots a, a radiation beam beam of radiation at you and uh, it does so from multiple different angles as it swirls around you and then the computer takes the information from that and starts generating images and so you get a slice from an image slice from up here and then a slice there and then another slice there and then you get another slice there and the slices just get lower and lower and lower. So you can look at the various different parts of the brain and everything inside. Well, if you're part of the emergency team, <clears throat> you can sit back there while it's happening because you got to watch the patient and make sure they don't crash. But as those slices are coming, you get to see what's going on. You get to be the first ones to discover what the injury is and then start thinking about what to do about it. And when those images started coming through and it got to where it should get to, and then it kept going on beyond that, they were just flabbergasted. Why? And after it does its initial thing, you can go back and you can scan through all the images. And they scan through all the images and they, they couldn't believe their eyes. There was absolutely no damage to the brain whatsoever. Not a bit of damage to the brain. What happened, they discovered, that bullet came in to the thinnest part of the skull. And it went through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and the galea neurotica and <clears throat> anyways, and it got to the bone, and it turned, and it went back, and around, and it went around the back side, and it came back around here, and it got to this side, and then it went, oh, let's turn, and straight out. So it looked like it went straight in and straight out, but it actually went around her skull and out the other side. From a physics standpoint, inertia, momentum, <clears throat> impossible, absolutely impossible. And that's why the the trauma team was so <clears throat> like surprised about this this whole situation because it was impossible. Why? God intervened. In that case, he said, "No, because it's not going to work out for good in the end." But fire that only burns by God's power and through predictable laws has burned millions of martyrs to ashes. And animals like lions who live and act by the power of God given to them through predictable laws have killed and slaughtered many martyrs. <clears throat> and men who act according to their own sphere of action, but by the power of God, have used their arms to do incredible wickedness. 
and bullets that operate by the power of God through predictable laws have taken the life or have injured many, many millions. <clears throat> it's difficult for us to understand when God intervenes and when he doesn't. And really, it's not so much our business. Our business is to recognize that he is a God of love. Our business is to recognize his character, that he has our best interest in mind. Our business is not to figure out everything that he does and why he does everything that he does. We can simply understand he does it out of a, out of a sense of love and to work out the best that he possibly can. And when we know that, then we can deal with the things that we don't understand so well. We are like ants, and ants don't have a very long perspective. <clears throat> they can only see a very short distance. God can see the end from the beginning. He knows what he's doing. He knows what is needed to be allowed so that an evil cause <clears throat> will produce evil effects so that we can see that the cause was evil. And we can come to hate the evil and desire the good and be saved at last. <clears throat> and when we are privileged, when in the future we get to look at the record, and we get to see not only what people were, and what they did and what they said, but what they thought and what was motivating them. And when we get to see that whole record of end to the beginning in this whole great controversy, we will agree with God. And we will agree with everything he permitted. And we will agree with everything that he allowed we will agree with everything that he didn't permit, that he didn't allow. <clears throat> and we will be in total agreement with him. Yes, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And yes, no temptation, trial, torture has overtaken you except such as is common to men, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Those are true. Those are true. Those will never change. <clears throat> we can trust in that. We can rely upon that. And when things do not go well, when things go apparently horribly wrong. We can still go back to the cross and <clears throat> we can look at the one hanging there and we can look in his eyes and we can remember that he suffered terribly. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Because he is love. And the very love that suffered so much for us is the very same love that allows our own sufferings for our own salvation. <clears throat> and may we keep that in mind. Yes, there are all these things that are outside of us. Yes, they're like fires that are threatening to burn us. Yes, Satan kindles these fires so that he might destroy us. And yeah, there we are trying to control all of that. <clears throat> but there's a problem, and the problem is inside of me. And <clears throat> Jesus knows that, and Jesus knows all the stuff that's around. And so what he does is he surrounds us with his presence. And he filters everything that gets in. 
so that all that can get in is what he says okay to. And instead of destroying us, what gets in refines us, purifies us, works out for our best good. We don't have to worry about all the things out there because we have him surrounding us. It cannot get to us unless he says okay. And if he says okay, it will work out for good. It will. And the Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. You see, Jesus understood Father's presence was around him. <clears throat> and nothing, absolutely nothing, could get to Jesus unless the Father said, okay. So Jesus had nothing to resist. He had nothing to fight against. He had nothing to, <clears throat> nothing, because his Father was his defense. And when we understand the lesson, we will recognize that Christ is our defense in the very same way. There is absolutely nothing that can get to you. God has infinite power. There is nothing that can break through God's power. He is like a living force field that is around you. Nothing, absolutely nothing can get through unless God says okay. And when he says okay, it will hurt. It will be painful. Our tendency in our sinful condition is to look at it and think that it's for our destruction. No. It's only for our purification. It's only for our good. He will only allow those things that will work together for good to them that love God. And you can trust that. So yes, I have a problem inside of me. And the problem inside of me makes me think that the problem is outside of me. And that problem is like a misshaped, impure metal. And that impure metal needs to be melted. It needs to be reformed. How is it going to be melted and reformed? The fire. The fire. <clears throat> is fire comfortable? No, it's not. Is it painful? Yes, it is. Is that metal going to be purified without the fire? No. No, it won't. So Christ, the refiner, surrounds us with his presence. Satan, the destroyer, tries to turn up the heat so hot that it'll destroy us. But Jesus says, okay, you can get this much in, that 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 much in, and no farther. Just like with Job. He said, you can go thus far, but you cannot go any farther. <clears throat> you can touch all if he has it, but you cannot touch the man. And later you can touch him, but you cannot take his life. God always has limits on the enemy. So that it'll never be too much. And Jesus filters it. He says, okay, 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 okay. And now it's being purified. And now he's starting to see his reflection in it. And it, you know, and so on. And he, okay, okay, yep. Oh, there's heat. And you, you and I are thinking, oh, we're dying. We're dying. I can't handle this. This is too much. I can't do this. Uh-uh. He's saying, okay, 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 okay. Stop. Perfect. And Satan just used all of that energy to try to destroy you. And God worked it out to purify you. <clears throat> now, let's go back to interpersonal relationships with this idea of sphere of action and how we relate to it in certain ways. 
So let's say that you have a spouse that's a hoarder. As you can see in this home. So how do you relate to your spouse? How do you relate to the home? <clears throat> how do you relate to God? And so on in this situation. Your spouse is the hoarder, and you are the one that would prefer things to be a bit more clean and orderly. Well, first, the question is, who owns the house? You? Is it your spouse? Or is it God? Yeah. Whose house is it? It's God's house. <clears throat> who are you accountable to? Are you accountable to your spouse? No, you are not. Who are you accountable to? To God. Because he owned you. You belong to him. He created you. Who is your spouse accountable to? You? Mm -mm. No. No, that, if you think your spouse is accountable to you, that is the I am God playing out in your life. And you think that you are the one that created them or that they belong to or so on. No, they are accountable to God and God alone. <clears throat> what are you accountable for? Hmm. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a good question. What are you accountable for? <clears throat> are you accountable for how you relate to the house rather, relative to its cleanliness and orderliness? Or are you resp are you accountable for the outcome of the house in other words <clears throat> are you accountable to god for how you pick up or don't pick up things how you clean or don't clean things how you <clears throat> order or don't order things in the home or are you responsible for the ho home being clean, being orderly, and so on? What are you responsible for? What are you accountable for? Well, the question is also that we can ask is who has the delegated authority? Again, all authority comes from God, and we'll be looking at that next week, <clears throat> authority and submission. But all authority comes from God. In this case, who has the delegated authority in relation to the house as a whole or to different parts or locations of the house? Is the delegated authority to you in relation to the house or is it in relation to your spouse? Is it your spouse? <clears throat> if you are the cleanly one and they are the hoarder, but they're the one that the mortgage is in their name, they're earning the money to pay the mortgage, or they're the one that have paid the mortgage off and so on and so forth, well, they're the one with the delegated authority, and <clears throat> they can determine what parts of that house they are responsible and what parts of that house you are responsible for. Right. So the question is, what space are you responsible for in the house? <clears throat> are you responsible for all of it? <clears throat> well, then you have freedom to go about organizing and cleaning all of it. What space are they responsible for? Perhaps, let's say, for instance, in this case, you have a hoarding husband and you have a... <clears throat> a um, a wonderfully clean wife, and uh, and so on. And the husband says, don't touch the garage. Don't touch this side of the bedroom. Don't touch the living room and the den. Those are mine. Okay. You leave those alone. <clears throat> you don't touch the garage. 
You don't touch the den and you don't touch the living room. I mean, you might sit in the living room, but you don't clean it up. You don't touch his side of the of the room and uh, the bedroom and so on. He might say, that's my bathroom. All right. All right. Fine. <clears throat> what they do with their space is not your responsibility. That is none of your responsibility. If they keep that side of the room, they keep the den, if they keep the garage, if they keep the living room, a mess, an absolutely mess, absolute mess. None of your responsibility. None. You have a personal responsibility for your half of the house and your bathroom and the kitchen and whatever else is under your space agreed upon. <clears throat> so what you do with your space is your responsibility. So what are you accountable for? It's another good question. What are you accountable for? <clears throat> are you accountable for how you relate to the house? Or are you accountable for the final cleanliness and order of the house? So that if he doesn't do his job of cleaning up those parts of the house and those parts of the house remain dirty and cluttered and a mess, you're responsible for it because the house is not completely clean and, and ordered. No, no. <clears throat> now, is it ever good to try to take over someone else's stewardship to enter into their sphere of action? No, no, not at all. So even if your intention for entering into their sphere of action is for good, entering into somebody else's sphere of action is always for evil. In fact, everybody <clears throat> intervenes into somebody else's or tries to get into somebody else's sphere of action for the sake of some perceived good. Good intentions with bad actions, getting out of your sphere, is bad, period. So <clears throat> that's an example of relating to a, a hoarding spouse. But what if you have a secretive spouse? So your spouse doesn't want you to access their email. They don't want you being on their computer. They don't want to be on your, you to be on their phone. They don't want you to be tracking this, listening to that, poking into this and that and the other thing and so on and so forth. So you have a secretive spouse. Well, first of all, ask yourself if you are a nosy nuisance. Sometimes we don't consider that. We think, well, I need to know, oh, okay, is your nose in the right place or is it in the wrong place? Now, a question, is your spouse accountable to you? And the answer is no, they're not. <clears throat> now, whatever they're doing in that secrecy, does God know what's going on? Yes, clearly he does. He is aware. So is secrecy a problem? Is secrecy a problem? Well, <clears throat> what about secrecy in relation to surprises? A surprise birthday party, a surprise gift, a surprise this, that, or the other thing, <clears throat> right? Does secrecy always mean something wrong? No, no, it doesn't. Not at all, right? <clears throat> but it's true that secrecy can indicate that there's a problem. It can, very clearly. So it can indicate that there is a lack of trust, it can ind indicate that there's a fear of rejection if you find out what's going on. But are you ever responsible for what somebody else does? The answer is no, you're not. You're not. So if you try to take that responsibility, then who are you? Well, clearly, you're acting like your own selfish God. Not like God acts, because God leaves an individual free in their sphere of action. He will never get into somebody else's sphere of action. But as a selfish God, you try to get into somebody else's sphere of action. 
And getting into somebody else's sphere always results in conflict. You will create the conflict by trying to solve the secrecy. <clears throat> so these are things for us to consider. Could the secrecy be a problem? Yes, it could. Does that mean that we should never ask any, any questions for their sake? Well, no. Communication, it's nice to have communication. Right? But if they're going to continue to keep their secrets, okay. Well, they keep their secrets. You leave that in God's hands. He knows what it's, what's going on. And somebody who's keeping secrets will almost always mess up at some time. And that will come become revealed at some point. Well, it's fine. You wait <clears throat> until God allows that to happen. And uh, you trust God. You have God as your source. And you're there to give to your secretive spouse as they will accept. And you serve as a channel between God and them. Now, what about reputation as opposed to influence? Your influence is the impact that your words and actions have upon others. There is an atmosphere that is around each individual. And that influence comes from your own sphere of action. It's your own words, your own actions, your own... Uh, again, there's an atmosphere around an individual. Your reputation, however, is what others think about you. So that comes from their sphere of action. So again, influence comes from your sphere of action. It's what you say and what you do. Reputation is what others think about you. That is their sphere of action. So which are you responsible for? Your influence or your reputation? your influence. You have no responsibility for reputation. If your reputation is bad, is that your responsibility? Only if your influence was bad. But <clears throat> even then, <laughs> they have their own responsibility for what they think of you. That's their own responsibility. So if your influence is bad, is that your responsibility? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. So which do you need to guard or control? Your reputation or your influence? Your influence. That's what you need to guard. <laughs> if you try to guard or control your reputation, are you inside or outside of your sphere of action? You're outside. Everybody that seeks to guard reputation is outside of their sphere of action. You leave that in God's hands. He'll take care of it. So if you're trying to control reputation, who are you? Well, again, you're the selfish I am God <clears throat> and trying to control others and what's outside of you. Now, what if you have a forgetful spouse? <clears throat> they frequently forget what you ask them to do and, and so on. They don't have dementia. That's proven by their good memory and, and many other things. But when you ask them to do things, and it's not particularly things that they enjoy, they frequently forget. So uh, to f inform them when they don't know about something, well, that's fine. That's informing and information is good. But to keep reminding them, that's not information anymore. That's nagging. And nagging is control. It's an attempt to control the other individual by repetition, 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 wearing them down. Bring them down. <clears throat> if you are nagging, you are out of your sphere of action. And you are trying to control the other individual. And if you are out of your sphere of action, are you in the right place or are you in the wrong place? Wrong place. You're wrong to get out of your sphere of action and to try to control others. 
These are important things for us to recognize. These are important things for us to remember. Now, when it comes to boundaries, talked about sphere of action because we need to understand <clears throat> the concept of sphere of action and the applications of the sphere of, sphere of action before we then talk about boundaries. Now, when we talk about healthy boundaries, healthy boundaries are absolutely necessary for proper function and for healthy relationships. Boundaries are absolutely necessary. But what are the boundaries and what are they for? <clears throat> I can never erect boundaries for someone else. I can never erect boundaries for someone else. Boundaries are always... going to be in relation to myself. I can't put a boundary around somebody else. I can't prevent or control how they behave and so on and so forth. And if I try to use boundaries for the sake of controlling somebody else's behavior and so on, I'm wrong. I'm already stepping out of somebody else into somebody else's sphere of action and trying to control them and so on. So that's how we usually, that's how we usually um, use boundaries. And then how we usually perceive of boundaries is I'm going to use this boundary in order to control somebody else so that they cannot X, Y, or Z. <clears throat> what is a healthy boundary? Healthy boundaries keep you from letting others into your sphere. And they keep you out of others' sphere of action. That's what healthy boundaries do. They keep other keep you from letting others into your sphere of action. But again, remember, you can never really let somebody in your sphere of action. It's only in the delusion <clears throat> that you change what you think and how you say what you say and do in relation to them because you think that they possess something that you need. And you're going to bind yourself to them in order to get that. It's your own delusion. But the boundary is then going to be the truth. <laughs> the truth is going to be the boundary that frees you from the delusion so that now you don't have to modify how you think and what you say and what you do in relation to another individual. You do so in relation to God because you belong to him and you're accountable to him, but not to other individuals. So that boundary is going to keep them from, from keep you from letting others into your sphere of action, and it's going to keep you out of other sphere of action. So boundaries are absolutely necessary because they preserve a sphere of action. And they keep you out of God's sphere of action. Proper boundaries are going to keep, keep you out of God's sphere of action. So anytime that there's a proper boundary, you are exercising that boundary yourself in relation to yourself as you relate to others. Now, is that boundary in order to protect you from what is outside of you? No. No. It's to <clears throat> protect <laughs> God's plan for your life and his, his work in your life and so on. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Now, <clears throat> we will automatically erect boundaries according to perception. If you perceive that you are in danger, without a choice, you will erect a boundary without a choice. If, for example, here we have a person and a lion. Let's say that you're in a space where there is no fence and the big kitty starts coming at you <clears throat> and at a fairly quick pace, not a run, but a, a fairly quick pace. 
if you perceive that you are in danger in that situation, you cannot help but erect boundaries. And again, boundaries might be fighter, it's going to be fight or flight response. It might be putting distance between you and the lion, hopefully more distance than the lion puts, takes away from between the two of you as it comes closer. Um, <clears throat> you might put up boundaries of fighting the lion or other things of that nature, but you cannot help but erect boundaries when you perceive danger. And you cannot help but erecting the boundaries to protect yourself when you perceive danger. But the moment you per, you erect a boundary to protect yourself, you can know that you are wrong. You can know you're wrong. Because it is wrong to ever erect a boundary to protect yourself. First of all, you are not your own. You do not belong to you. You belong to God. <clears throat> Secondly, when you perceive that you're in danger, you have forgotten that Christ surrounds you with his presence and nothing can get to you except by his permission. And all things that he permits work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So nothing in Christ, nothing can get to you that can work out for evil. Only the things that can, the only things that can get to you are those things that can work out for good. So are you ever really in danger? And the answer is no. It's a misperception of the delusion of sinful nature is the perception that I am in danger. And because I perceive that I am in danger, now I must erect a boundary in order to protect myself. So when I erect a boundary to protect myself, it's always coming from a sinful nature. It's always coming from a state of delusion, always. <clears throat> when the storm came and threatened to sink the boat that the disciples were in, Jesus was in it too. They were rowing, he was sleeping. They thought they were dying. He was sleeping. They woke him up, and the moment they woke him up, he was not like, oh, God. No, he was in peace. Why? Because Jesus never perceived himself in danger. Yes. There were angry foes around him. Yes, there were circumstances and situations, but he trusted his father's care of him and his father's presence surrounding him. Nothing could befall him except by his father's permission, and he knew his father loved him. When he spoke, peace be still to that storm, and everything quieted. And then they got to the other shore. They got out of the bo boat, and they started walking, and all of a sudden, two men, demon-possessed men who had broken chains and were bleeding and naked and had been the, the, <clears throat> the terror of that area, came rushing at them with all the ferocity of demons. And <clears throat> what did Peter, James, John, and all the rest of them do? They perceived danger. And they couldn't help it without a choice. They put distance between themselves and those demon-possessed men. Where did Jesus go? Nowhere. They turned around and realized Jesus wasn't with them. And they went back to see where he was, and he was exactly where they left him. He didn't move an inch. Not an inch. Why? He didn't perceive danger because he was in his father's care and that is our privilege that the truth might set us free that we might recognize that we are surrounded by the presence of christ that nothing can befall us except by his permission and all that can befall us can it can only work out for good <clears throat> so when we know the truth and we see the truth 
then we recognize there is no danger out there. The danger only comes from in here. But when the danger is in here, it makes me perceive the danger out there. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> boundaries are automatic based upon perceptions. If you perceive danger, you can't help but put a boundary to protect yourself. If you perceive no danger, there's no need for a boundary. So, if that big kitty and that lion started coming at you at a fairly good clip, very good, very, fairly good pace, <clears throat> but that was your lion. You raised that lion. It's your kitty cat. You have a good relationship with that kitty cat. You have no reason to have a fence. You have no reason to put distance between the two of you. In fact, you might run towards the kitty while the kitty's running towards you because you know what's coming. And there's going to be a kitty hug coming. <clears throat> and some kitty playtime coming. No need for, for a boundary if there's no danger. But if there's danger somewhere out there, but there's already a boundary that's put there <clears throat> and you're already protected by that boundary. Like in this case, well, there's no need for you to put up your own boundary. And that's the case. Yes. Is there a dangerous enemy? Yes, there is. Are there dangerous things that are around? Yes, there are. But God is the one who has erected the boundary and you and I don't have to fear anything because we already have his boundary and we don't have to put our own boundary up. You know, now, what are unhealthy boundaries? Well, false perceptions lead me <clears throat> to break boundaries. And so I try to enter into God's sphere, and I try to enter into the sphere of others. That's breaking down boundaries, getting out of one sphere into another sphere. That is breaking boundaries. Sin is going to cause that. The delusion is going to cause that. And yes, I try to keep others out of my sphere. I try to keep them to, from controlling me, but I freely enter into theirs. That's what selfishness does. And <clears throat> I, that, I break down the, the, those appropriate boundaries of not getting into somebody else's sphere of action because of the false perception that I am God. Now, God doesn't ever do that. It's just in my sinful context, I... I act in a selfish way as a little selfish God. Now, <clears throat> if the boundaries are to protect myself, they will always end up being harmful, always, because anything done to protect self comes from selfishness. I think that I am my own. It comes from the I am God deception. And the I am God delusion and selfishness never works out well in the end, even though everything that I do in selfishness appears to me to be good or right or a gain, something of that nature, when it's completely the opposite. So the motivation is for self, it's selfish, and selfishness never turns out well in the end, even though it might seem good at the time. And the question is, are you, are, are you your own? And the answer is, no, you're not. So you can never do something for yourself. You are not your own. So let's look at boundaries in the life of Jesus. Jesus had a mission given to him by his father. And he did have boundaries to protect that mission so that he never got distracted and diverted from the mission given to him by his father. So he had an accountability to his father, and he had a mission given to him by his father, and the boundaries were there in order for him to not get distracted or dissuaded, but to continue on in that mission. <clears throat> Luke 2, 49, after Jesus' parents had lost him for three days and then finally found him in the, in the sanctuary, he was 12 years of age, had First time there at the Passover, realized for the first time that he was the Christ, the Messiah, and what his true relation to was to his heavenly father. And his mother came back and she rebuked him. Son, why have you caused us this sorrowing and that we were looking for you? And, <laughs> and 
he had a very gentle, respectful rebuke back for her. Why did you seek me? Like, why were you looking for me? Who was it that lost me? Because I know where I am. I know where I'm, I've known where I'm at. Who was it that lost me? Who has the responsibility to care for me? And yeah, he, you know, he did it in a very gentle way. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? <clears throat> I can't let you manage this life. That's his responsibility. Not yours. <clears throat> Jesus' brothers, they did not believe him. They didn't believe that he was anything more than just them, but maybe a little more goody-goody two-shoes. And they said, well, if anybody's anybody, they'll go to Jerusalem and show themselves. You go up to Jerusalem, it's the feast time. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you. Why? Because you're just like the world. And it, it loves its own. But it hates me. Why? Because I'm not like the world. <clears throat> because I testify of it that its works are evil. By my life, by my words, by my teachings. You go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast for my time is not yet fully come. No, you, brothers, cannot divert me from the plan of God for my life. Right. Now, <clears throat> the boundaries were there. But the boundaries were for so that Jesus would not get diverted from the plan, his father's plan. They were not for himself. They were for his father's plan. So they weren't selfish. And they didn't, the, the boundaries didn't dictate what others did or didn't do. They still had the freedom to try to intrude, but the boundaries prevented them from being able to get in so that he simply did what his father's plan was, what his father's business was. <clears throat> and then later, he wasn't eating very much. He wasn't sleeping very much. He wasn't taking breaks like they thought he should. The ministry was not necessarily going the direction that they thought they, it should. He had given some pretty hard rebukes to some of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and murmurings were going around, and people, you know, some of the religious leaders were not liking him so much, and his family was not happy in the direction that the ministry was going in, because it reflected upon them, they thought, <laughs> since they were mother and brothers. And so they came to, you know, have a chat with Jesus and, you know, talk about <clears throat> reordering how he was doing this ministry thing. But they got to the house where he was at, and there were so many people they couldn't get through. So somebody passed the message on to him, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Boundaries. Always boundaries for the mission. So you belong to God, you don't belong to yourself. And you have no right to allow others to divert you from God's will and God's plan for your life. None. You're only the steward. And you're the steward there for God's purposes. You belong to him, you do not belong to them. And in Christ, you will have boundaries to protect God's will and his plan for your life. It will happen when you know the truth and the truth will be your boundary. And always, you will maintain that boundary with utmost respect and a gentle firmness. Not rude, not obnoxious, not any of that, but we're respectful, but gently firm. Jesus, however, never put up a boundary to protect himself, ever. Now, somebody might say, okay, well, you know, he was <clears throat> taken to the cliff and about to thrown off the cliff, and then he disappeared and walked through the midst of them. Yes, that was not him causing himself to disappear. He trusted himself in his father's hands, and it was the angels that surrounded him. And they caused the people to lose sight of Jesus, and they walked him out of that, that crowd and, and so on. He trusted in the protection of his father. In the, in the storm, he wasn't calm because he had all power to calm the storm himself. He was calm because he trusted in his father who had all power to calm the storm. He never put a boundary to protect himself. And we see that. 
He knew his father already set up the boundary for him. He had no boundary for himself. Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. No boundaries for himself. <clears throat> he said, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? He understood this was part of his father's will, and he was submitted to the will of his father. Do you not? Do you think that I cannot now pray my father, and he will provide for me, pro provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? He knew he was within the will of his father while these things were happening, and so there was no, no boundaries, no boundaries. They spat in his face. No boundaries. They beat him. No boundaries. <clears throat> Others struck him with the palms of their hands. They slapped him. No boundaries. They, they said, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? They put a bag on his head and punched him in the face and said that. No boundaries. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. No boundaries. No, they twisted a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. No boundaries. They put a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! No boundaries. <clears throat> they spat on him again. No boundaries. They took the reed and beat him in the head and drove those thorns into his brow. No boundaries. Pilate said to him, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? <laughs> Jesus had news for him. He said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. There's only one source of power, and that is God. And Jesus knew it. And he knew that Pilate had absolutely no power to do anything unless God said, okay. But if God said, okay, he knew it would work out for good. No boundaries for himself. They crucified him. No boundaries. So, when we have the truth, we know the truth, and we live by the truth, we will have no boundaries for ourselves. None whatsoever. But there will be boundaries for God's plan and his purpose for our lives so that we never get diverted from it. That's what the truth will lead us to. <clears throat> and yes, our sinful nature, our sinful problem is inside of us. And it's a big problem. <clears throat> and yes, there is a lot of fire that needs to get in in order to refine us, in order to purify us in this sinful condition. And yes, Jesus surrounds us with his presence. And he measures everything. And he makes sure it's never too much. It's exactly what's needed in order for us to be saved, purified, restored. The very fires that we hate and we fear become the very ones that bring about the transformation and salvation in our lives. Praise God that he's a loving and faithful refiner. And this is sphere of action and healthy boundaries. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> and then I'm sure there's going to be questions. There are always are. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God like that. Thank you that you surround us with your presence. Thank you that truly there is nothing to fear except what is inside. <clears throat> and Lord, thank you that you are faithful that you never enter into our sphere of action and mess around there. 
the Lord teach us to never mess around in somebody else's sphere of action, but to simply remain in ours. And may those boundaries be erected like Jesus for the mission and the plan you have for our lives so that we do not get distracted. Never for protecting self, no boundaries for self's sake, for that's in your hands. You know what fires to let in, and what ones to leave out. And Lord, teach us to trust you like that and to be free from fear. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Questions? Wally. Okay. Yeah, okay, so um, I didn't catch you from the beginning. I was still trying to get on. I'm not very computer savvy with stuff, but anyway. Um, when you mentioned about um, Jesus sleeping in the boat, and then again, the other situation with the, the, the demoniacs, it seemed that, that, that they didn't get, um, they had a lack of faith with God, which was, they were, God was, Jesus was trying to show them. Because even when they ran, I mean, like, they had to be, the demoniacs had to be quite scary because they were, they were gone. You know, and if Jesus wasn't human like we are, but he didn't fear that because he knew, you know, where in, he was in the protection of his father, like you said. So he had right. no fear. So there was there was a, it was a matter of, of learning the faith, and that's you know, and then so that lesson had to come back because when they came back, then again it was like another lesson that they had to learn. What happened with the demoniacs and how they reacted when you know when, when Jesus did what he did with them. Yes. <clears throat> yes. That's a it's an excellent um <clears throat> those are excellent examples for us to look at. And um and then compare with how we look at things and respond to things and and look at Jesus and go, Oh, I want to be like that. Amen. Boy, you got that right. Um, you know. Another thought I had, I was listening because you brought to my mind. I remember uh, hearing a sermon years ago on that same, on based on that same story you were just talking about, Jesus sleeping in the boat, and um, it talked. About, yeah, the pastor talked about Peter, and Peter was arrested and he was in jail and prepared to die. He was going to die the next day. He slept. Yep. That yep. was exactly what Jesus did. So there was, you know, he. Just like so, that's a lesson that we we can't have. It's not impossible. Yes, no, it is. That's true. <clears throat> he was he was sleeping, and Paul he was confident too. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of times, you know, sometimes you just fall apart. Fall apart sometimes when when the enemy attacks. You know, <laughs> instead of just like hanging on, you just fall apart. Oh no, now what? You know. Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, DB. Hi, Dr. Mark. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, um, a question uh, like, okay, so putting up a boundary to protect yourself, uh, how does that work with like somebody... Uh, like somebody wants to start a relationship with you, but you realize that there may be some differences in beliefs, like you you know they're not a Christian or some such thing. And so you put up your own barrier to kind of avoid the situation or at least not encourage it or say no or, you know, how do you know? Because... Sometimes we can let ourselves fall into the lion's den and then later realize, uh oh, I made a mistake. I really should not be in here. And so in that sense, can we put up a boundary to protect ourselves if we know that something we think is according to God's will, like we shouldn't be unequally yoked or you could, 
you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> um, yes, but uh, technically speaking, um, I would question, do you belong to yourself? And the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> and do you do you ultimately represent yourself? The answer is no. You represent the one that created you, the one that you belong to. Um, at least you reflect upon your creator and so on. And you have an accountability to your creator for that. And so when it comes to a relationship with others who might be, uh, for example, the situation you gave where you find out that you're unequally yoked, well, what was the purpose for the relationship in the first place? Were you in the relationship that you might uh, take from the individual or were you in the relationship so that you might give to the individual? And <clears throat> if it was for the taking, well, then we know that we, that you were already in the wrong place, you know, um, because that's what sinful nature does. Sinful nature goes to other people as my source and it takes from them as the source. And now I'm dependent upon them and and so on, whereas the law of God shows us that we are to be dependent upon God and take from him, and that the relationship with others is for us to give to. So if I'm giving to another individual, <clears throat> then um, let's say in a friend relationship or a church relationship or something like that, if I'm giving to an other individual, and that's the purpose, my purpose in the relationship is that I might give to them, um, then you know, it doesn't matter what they're like. I can continue to to give as long as it's going to be for their good. Now, there could become pathologic giving where where it ends up being then problematic for others. And if that's going to be the case, then I would cease doing so because I want their best good. And um, <clears throat> and so on. But but if we're talking about like a marriage relationship or we're looking at a relationship where we're, we're seeking to understand whether we can work together with this individual towards common goals that God has given to us, well, then, yes, there needs to be an assessment of <clears throat> the compatibility of the other individual in relation to how we work together towards God's goals, whatever those goals are. And it's perfectly, you know, fine to evaluate that relationship from that standpoint, and then to assess whether this is going to be something that will, that will augment or increase the ability to accomplish God's purposes, God's goals through our lives working together as opposed to working individually? Or is it going to be something that hinders that? And because my, my boundaries are there for God's purpose and God's goal, in order to not get diverted from that, when I realize that the other individual and I are not in harmony from that standpoint, and they're looking at going that way when I'm looking at going that way. Well, it's easy. I mean, it's not a it's not an emotionally charged, <clears throat> you know, decision or other things like that. You were simply in the relationship to find out whether this was going to be something that's going to work in that direction and for God's good, and you realize that it's not, and so it's time to to stop pursuing that relationship from that standpoint, but you can still be a friend with them and you can still take from God and give to them and, and so on. Yes, if they have the wrong perspective and they were looking at having you as the source and now you're deciding that this is not going to go on any further, then yes, they're going to, um, you know, they're going to, uh, probably take it in a bad way because sinful nature is going to take anything in a bad way. That's just what it does. And that's sad. And if they want to have distance from you, you let them have distance from you. And But you continue to act, you know, to interact with them when you do, like at church or other places like that. And you're you're cheerful and you're kind and you say hello. And But if they want their space, you give them their space. And and so on. And and so the problem is, is when we get really emotionally charged is because we're looking to the other individual as a source. And we're looking to somebody to source from and to be with so that we can source from. And we're looking for somebody to be good 
and then we find out that somebody's actually not good for us. They're actually bad for us. But now we're dealing with source issues. And when you're dealing with source issues and sources, it becomes very emotionally charged. It becomes very problematic and difficult from that standpoint because now, you know, what do you do when you have a source that's not good? You don't like that. But then if you don't have another alternative source for that, then you're going to be left without your needs being supplied and fulfilled. And it becomes very problematic from that standpoint. And these are the problems that come because of sinful nature and our perception that others are our source rather than God being our source. And okay, God, you know, God's there and he's he, He's willing to help us <clears throat> along out of that. And and we recognize that we don't come out of sinful nature into the nature of Christ like that. We're all still on the journey. And <clears throat> so that means that there's going to be hiccups along the way. There's going to be difficulties. It's not going to work perfectly right from the beginning. And yes, we recognize that, but the grace of God again, allows us to fall and to make mistakes as many times as is needed in the process of learning how to walk and learning how to, to trust in God and to live a Christ-like Christ -like life and so on. Um, and then it becomes less and less internally problematic for us when we're involved in these uh, circumstances and situations. Belinda. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering um, from if, if we're not responsible for other people's actions and we're not called to intervene in their actions, then um, what about all the examples in the Bible where um, the nations or groups of people would suffer for the sins of one committed, like Achan, and how Phineas went in and stopped the stopped the plague by intervening in his actions, and he was praised for that and things like that. How how does that fit? All right. So when you have uh, a situation next week, we're going to be talking about authority and submission. And uh, so that's going to get more into the authority and submission uh, discussion. But God, as the owner, as the ruler, as the governor, uh, he has also a law and he has a government to uphold. And, and he has the authority to uphold that government and to uh, make judgments and decide who is in, who is out what the criteria are for being in and out and for executing that. And God has the privilege and the capacity of delegating that authority to various different either individuals or groups of individuals or whatever. We see it in, in many different uh, circumstances. For example, God delegates his authority to angels. And in one night, the angel killed 185,000 of the enemy soldiers. God delegates that authority to, um, to nations like Israel. He delegated authority to Israel and then certain individuals within Israel in order to uh, act on his behalf in a judgmental, or I say judgmental, in a judicial, that's the word that I should use, in a judicial sense uh, in relation to things that are happening in the society. And, um, and uh, Phineas, that was something that was delegated to him as the priest in the situation that was going on there. Uh, in our situation, commonly, uh, that authority is delegated to military, it's delegated to police, it's delegated to official authorities in relation to um, those that must protect the, the citizens and society in relation to crime and other things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> and so that is 
that is in question to, to civil authority and so on. And yes, there must be a civil authority anytime that there's sin. Again, we'll get more into that discussion in um, next week when we cover uh, authority and submission. Um, and we'll get into it more when we get into parenting, because that discussion comes into parenting as well. And how do we how do we raise or parent our children uh, from that standpoint? But <clears throat> while I might, let's say, for instance, if I was a police officer and I had authority, civil authority and God's delegated authority to deal with crime. And Paul says that they they carry the sword, which nowadays is a gun and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, so that they might put fear in the hearts of of um not sinners, but I mean, yes, sinners, but uh, in the in the hearts of criminals. That's that's what I was looking for. Um, <clears throat> and to protect society. Well, if I was a police officer, then I have a delegated authority to deal with crime. But crime is what an individual said and did. Crime is not what an individual thinks and believes and chooses and so on. Crime is what they actually accomplish. And so now it's in God's fear. And as a delegated authority of God, now in God's sphere, I can act in God's behalf as a steward of his authority in relation to whatever that crime or that thing was that happened. Hmm. What about um, in terms of the body, you know, like the the body of of Messiah that um you know I think Paul talks about if if one part is suffering then we'll all suffer and isn't that about being somewhat in each other's business a little bit? <laughs> well it's true that as a <clears throat> whether it's a, a couple, a married couple, whether it's a family that might be three, four or however many, whether it's a a church, whether it's the entire body of Christ, whether it is whatever the <clears throat> the group is, there must be a, what should I say, a common identity, and there needs to be a common goal or a common action that each individual comes together to work together towards that goal or that outcome. And that's appropriate for any group. It's appropriate for a marriage. It's appropriate for a family and so on. But <clears throat> while that is the case, as the father of the home, I only have a responsibility for my relation to that purpose and that goal. I don't have a responsibility for how my wife relates to that responsibility and that goal. If she decides that she's going to go in this direction when God was leading us in this direction, well, it's going to make it more difficult for the family as a whole. It is, because we all have influence. Each one of us has influence, and we have a responsibility for our influence. But I don't have a responsibility for her if she goes off in that direction. <clears throat> Now, as the delegated authority and the priest of the home, I do have a stewardship responsibility to God to be his hands and feet in relation to her to see how we might rescue her back, if possible, right? and to be involved in that process with her, to pray for her, to intercede, to... Uh, seek for her best good, um, to, you know, to work from that standpoint, and, and so on. But it's never my responsibility to control what she believes, what she thinks, what she says, and what she does. But there may be a responsibility for consequences that come, right? Like in a marriage relationship, one of the consequences of infidelity is divorce. And that would be brought, brought on by the faithful spouse, not by the unfaithful spouse. In a church relation and so on, yes, we have a responsibility to work together, um, and there is an identity 
and a defined identity in regards to whatever group that might be and a goal and a purpose to work together and everybody should work together. And if somebody isn't, it's going to affect the whole group uh, to the degree of their influence. But still, even as a church member, I don't have a responsibility for what somebody else chooses to do or what they don't choose to do. But if I have a position of authority in the church, then I, as the delegated authority of God, then I have a responsibility to seek to address issues in love for the purpose of restoration, that we might restore the common purpose, the common goal of that group, and, <clears throat> and then to be able to continue forward uh, working well from that standpoint. And if that's not going to happen because they're going to do their thing regardless of what I say, and I've gone to them and tried to work with them, and then I've taken others with me and tried to work with them, and then we bring it to the whole truth, church, and we try to work with them uh, in order to, you know, rescue them, restore them back, and so on, and they won't be, then we let them have their decision and we let them go. Uh, so that the group now can continue moving forward in what God had had called it to do. Mm, thank you. Welcome, Cherry. Oh, let me see if I can remember. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you're going to be dealing with parenting to next week. Is that correct? I'm going to do authority and submission next week. Parenting is coming up in. It's going to be <clears throat> probably May range. Okay, no, no worries. Okay. So, yeah. so I have a question. This is one of the things I struggle with the most. What about those in your life that you know are not walking with God? And the so the promise, all things work together for good for those who love God, doesn't apply. How do you have peace about that? So do is everything in the great controversy going to work out together for good? No. Will the great controversy work out together for good? Well, yeah, but not for the people who are lost. Okay. Yes. No. <laughs> That's what no. I'm their, their situation will be the best that it could be considering the circumstances and situations. God will work that out. Whatever whatever the best that it could be, you know, considering what, what it was, that's where God is going. Uh, is it ultimately going to end up good for them? being lost and <clears throat> then destroyed and ceasing to exist? No, that's not going to be a good end as far as they're concerned. But even the destruction of the wicked will work out for good for all of the rest of God's creation. And <clears throat> so... Will there be any dissenting voice at the end? Or will all bow their knees before God and say, you are righteous and you are just? All will acknowledge the righteousness and the justice of God and will agree with the outcome to come. Everyone. Will agree. There will be no dissenters from that standpoint, including Satan and the ones who will be destroyed. <clears throat> Is it out of love? Yes, it's out of love. Does he do anything other than love? No, there's no other motivation that. <clears throat> and again, the love that we see hanging on the cross is the love that also is involved in all of these other processes as well. 
yes, it's difficult for us to see it now. Yes, it's difficult for under for us to understand why this, why that, why the other thing. And some of those questions, <clears throat> I don't know that they will be answered this side of eternity. I don't know that, that we will have all of those answers. But I know that God has given us clearly enough information for us to look at him and we can say, okay, though I don't understand, I trust you. And I believe that this is love because you are love. And this is how it will work out and so on. And... Um, <clears throat> Yes, we could we could we could spend time looking at the lost or we could spend time looking at the savior <clears throat> and one will benefit us and the other will not so what we focus on is important but also <clears throat> let us remember while they are still alive regardless of what their history has been and how long it has gone and so on, let us remember that we serve a living Savior and that he is still is a living Savior and that he is still the one that can rescue the souls that are murdering others. He is still the one that can rescue thieves on the cross that are towards their last breath and finally recognize who he is and surrender their lives to him. He is the one that can continue to save as long as there's an opportunity left in the individual. Do we know when that opportunity has left and they have, they are now, you know, beyond that point? No, we don't. So we look to him as the savior. We trust in him as the savior. We expect him to be the savior. We pray as if we believe he is the Savior, and we, in faith, hope for what the Savior will do in their lives, and we continue participating with him and cooperating with him in that intercession and in that hope as time goes on, expecting to see what he'll do and how he'll do it. I have another question that goes along with that. Um, I love the Desire of Ages, and I was listening, and it was saying that the angels in all of heaven are just absolutely horrified at our indifference um, for the law, the the lives of the lost. Yeah. And so, how do we know? You know, I totally agree with not getting in somebody's sphere of influence and i'm learning and it's been really a blessing in my life i i really really like it it's it's blessed my marriage and just so many relationships i'm just very grateful for it but how do you know when you're just trying not to bother them or when when you need to plead with them you know for their sake um, when you're messing, you know, in their sphere and when you're not, you know, because we need to do all we can to have a good influence without, like you said, nagging and all that mess that I'm trying to learn not to do. So, all right. so <clears throat> I would... I would simply ask one question, and that is, are you doing it under pressure or are you doing it in peace? I like that. Yeah. And if you're doing it under pressure, it's coming from the sinful nature. <clears throat> it has the wrong motives with it, though you're trying to do the right thing, but it's coming from the wrong place. And if you're doing it in peace, then it's coming in the right place, you know. It's coming from the right place. <clears throat> now, again, for everything sinful nature, Satan has a counterfeit. And <clears throat> sometimes his counterfeit for peace 
is indifference. So it's not indifference, but it's peace. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, <clears throat> there were some questions in the chat for a long time. I am going to get to you, Faluke and Lindsay, um, but I need to get to some of the questions that were there before you ever put your hand up. Um, <clears throat> one of those is, can cartilage be renewed or rebuilt? Um, and once it's gone, is it gone? And the answer is, uh, if it's gone, gone, then it's gone, gone. Um, but if there's some cartilage left, then it has chondro excuse me, chondrocytes in there, and the chondrocytes are what build the cartilage. And uh, as long as chondrocytes are there, then they have the possibility of continuing to work and um, potentially generate more cartilage. Cartilage has limited blood supply, so it doesn't regenerate very well. Uh, and usually if it's torn, it's going to remain torn, although it doesn't have to remain painful. But uh, if you get to the point where it's gone, then it's gone. And um, that might be, you know, looking at a joint replacement or something from that standpoint. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if it's not gone yet, but there's still some left, then there's things that you can do, like hydrating really well and uh, making sure you continue to be active you will lose the joints faster if you stop using them than if you keep using them and so on and then of course you know what's going on here that it's affecting there and uh, those are all questions that need to be asked <clears throat> and uh, the next question was would you please go over what process you went through uh, when presented with a scantily clad woman no. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, I, I don't know what I said last time, but I'll say something now. So you have a scantily clad, uh, individual. Well, the, one of the first things that I had to learn after I was learning how not to do all the other stuff that I had been doing my whole life. And <clears throat> that way, that is look at her eyes and keep looking at her eyes, right? Look at her face, look at her eyes, and keep looking at her face and looking at her eyes. Even if she's hanging over the, you know, hanging over the desk and, and things are about to fall out of her shirt. Look at her eyes and keep looking at her eyes. That's that's something that's um, <clears throat> a, uh, you know, a deliberate decision. Um, and now, is it going to be so much of a problem when somebody has a righteous nature? Is it going to be a difficulty doing that? No. But it's when you still have the sinful nature and you're trying not to go down that road. Um, and uh, and what else? Well, it's, you know, it's if you can, if you can, if you don't have to look, then you don't have to look, you know, uh, you can look away. Um, <clears throat> but. I find that I that as the farther I go along in the in the process, the less I'm triggered by the the scantily aspects, and I not that you know not that oh well hey I can go to strip club club now no, but uh, over time you come to recognize that it's it's not the it's not the the surface you know it's not the presentation it's not the the external attraction or the external beauty that's a that's a child of god and she belongs to god and she's precious to god and uh, yes she's dressed this way poor her you know because she doesn't understand her value that's why she's dressing that way and so then when you have that mindset then it's not so much of an attraction to the externals. It's more of a feeling sorry for her and being in the situation that she's in and then having a desire for her to be free from those things and, um, you know, and going on from there. And I know that's not exactly what you were asking about from before, but I'm sure it was recorded before and you might be able to find it somewhere. I can't remember what I said before. So, Faluke. Thank you very much for the presentation. My question is related to health. 
And the question is, um, I know about the, uh, the law of life issue. Can you um, help me understand what caused sixth in the pancreas? Okay, <clears throat> cysts in the yes. pancreas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or what is the remedy? What can the person do? I have somebody that's asking me that question. Okay. Seven day Adventists. They don't I've told them about uh health loss. They they had um breast cancer, but they have done chemo and everything. So they are now going for subsequent follow-up and they discover cysts in the pancreas last year. They said it's small, so this year again, it's still there. So mm -hmm. she was reaching out to what she can do. I've told her about the emotion taken from God side, so she can walk through that. But meanwhile, what, what can one do so that the cyst is not growing or become something that's... Right worse yeah yes, thank you because the current concern for a pancreatic cyst is that it might turn into pancreatic cancer um <clears throat> at some point and it might re it might reflect an abnormal growth process in the pancreas that eventually becomes pancreatic cancer and then pancreatic cancer is it's a bad boy it's highly deadly um not every pancreatic cyst turns into that um the question is, what's the cause? Uh, the answer is, it's going to be found in the mind. Um, and that needs to be, you know, looked for and and discovered and then removed. That's the only thing that I know of that will really be successful from that standpoint. Some people might think of applying hot and cold fomentations either over the upper um, <clears throat> the upper abdomen or the back in the same region because the pancreas is about equally between the front and the back uh, in the body. Um, some people might recommend doing poultices like castor oil poultice or charcoal poultice or comfrey poultice over the area at nighttime. How much of an effect does that have? I don't suspect much. The only healer is God. Um, so, the, it's going to God who is the healer and it's asking him to uh, bring about the healing and um, and then the things that you do like poultices and fomentations and you know other things like that is simply is simply how faith cooperates with God as God is in the process of bringing about the healing in the individual's life but you but you really got to get to the to the mind and the issues behind the mind. So they've already had breast cancer. And so that means that there have been issues in place uh, since that time. And if the breast cancer was treated with uh, surgery, chemo, radiation, and then the breast cancer was removed, but the issue of the mind remained, then the issue of the mind must manifest itself somewhere, somehow. And so it could be that it has moved from breast to pancreas and now it's starting to manifest there um and that's that's not unusual for something like that to happen so un finding the underlying cause of the mind i don't know of any reliable natural remedies for pancreatic cysts i don't and part of the question was how does a cyst develop and the answer is there's a number of different ways that cysts develop. They typically, there's typically some kind of inflammation or inflammatory process that's <clears throat> happening. And then the cells are producing or spitting out a lot of extra fluid in the area, building a membrane that uh, will go around whatever that thing is and then walling it off. Um, so, for example, I have a cyst right here in my knuckle, <clears throat> and I had I had gotten a splinter. I don't remember what I was doing, but I got a splinter, and the splinter went deep into the tissue. And I never got it out, and it never came out, and now there's a cyst around that. And yes, I could do surgery, and I could cut that thing out eventually. I'm not going to, but... 
uh, I could, and then the cyst wouldn't be there anymore, but it was an inflammatory process from an injury or a trauma. And, uh, but why does it happen in the pancreas? Because the pancreas wasn't traumatized, not like you got a splinter all the way through into the pancreas. So <clears throat> it, the, the cells had to get a signal somehow that something was going on in that area. And that could be the nervous system because you've got nerves going to that area, sending a signal to the cells, and then the cells are responding um, <clears throat> uh, unless they had some kind of chemical exposure in that special area or something else that happened in that special area, some kind of trauma, which is not usual. So the most likely thing is from the mind that's going to be the cause of the inflammation and then the cyst development. Um, and then if that continues, if the cause continues, then it will continue to progress from that standpoint. Um, so that's, that's the best that I can say right now. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Hold on, Lindsay. I know you're next, um, but I still had more questions in the chat before your hand went up. Um <clears throat> Thank you. Somebody was saying, keep talking faith, Dr. Mark. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Keep praising and thanking him. Yes, I praise him that camp meeting will be here soon, and whatever is needed for that to be done will be done. Everything that we need for everything else will be done, because he's the source and the resource for it all. Uh, somebody said, you may have covered this. What are practical examples of what it would look like if God got into our sphere of action? Well, if God got into our sphere of action, uh, we would simply be robots or automatons. Um, he would direct everything that we do, and we wouldn't have self-government. Um, that's what would happen if God got into our sphere of action. And then the question is, does Satan get into our sphere of action? The answer is no. He tries. He tries to uh, convince us to surrender our sphere to him. But he can't force his way in. The spirit can never be forced from the outside. It can only, it can only consent. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what happens when the spirit consents and Satan is involved? Well, we we reflect the spirit. We mimic the spirit, uh, the Satan, and um, and uh, you know, like the demoniacs that came to Jesus and so on. But they weren't nearly as demon possessed as the religious leaders that followed him and hunted him from place to place, but seemed to be logical and respectable and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> another one. So while we cannot control the toxins that are in the food we purchase and we do our best in selecting foods that nourish the body, are we responsible for the negative effect uh, on our health, meaning the invisible toxins and that kind of stuff? No. No, you're, you're never responsible for what you cannot see, what you cannot know, what you cannot perceive. There can be no responsibility for that, uh, which is why I can never be responsible for making somebody else sick. That's impossible. Um, and, okay, so, Lindsay. Thank you, Dr. Mark. It was a wonderful presentation today. Um, I have a situation going on at the moment um, in my life. Um, I live in a retirement village and um, I pay corporate fees to have the body made, the, um, the buildings maintained. Um, and uh, we have not had that done for the last four years since COVID. And um, on my balcony now, right outside and growing inside my spare bedroom window are all these spiders and cobwebs. It literally looks like Halloween night. Um, now I've approached the management and um, I'm just a little bit skeptical as to um, you know when this will get done because I've approached them before and they've um, sort of said, oh, yes, we're going to do that next March weather permitting, and you know, as I say, I've been paying these fees for four years. Now, in my thinking, and after the presentation today, um, I've come to that place now because I want peace. Um, that's the main thing I want. Um, and I'm thinking, well, it's God's building and it's his money. 
so I can rest in that. But I'm just looking at from the judicial side of things as to how do I now um, just go about it? Do I just leave it now in God's hands? And if they never get cleaned again, that's okay. And I can live with that. Um, yeah, I just want to know um, how right. I can so, live in peace. Right. So if you're if you're dealing with a corporation and a corporation uh, involves multiple individuals, not just one, um, then if... For example, if the the information had been given to the secretary at the desk and whatever, but they're not the ones ultimately responsible for calling the exterminator and, you know, yada, 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 and whatever, you can have things that are lost in communication along the way and and, and so on. And it's not nagging to go back and ask you know, how are things progressing from that standpoint? Because you're dealing with multiple individuals and you don't know if the information has made it from point A to point Z, where, wherever it needs to go. Um, and that can be fine. Or you can have turnover of personnel and one person's no longer there and that's who you gave the information to and you're waiting for things to get done and they're no longer there. So they told you March, you know, it'd be done by March. You're in April so it would be fine, you know, appropriate for you to go back and and just inquire how things are going. And and um, you might be talking with somebody else and, and you say, well, you know, we, we talked about it. They said it'd be done in March and, and, and it's April and it still hasn't. And I'm just checking to see how things are going along. You don't do it in pressure. You don't try to, you know, <clears throat> force them to uh, to go there or whatever. It's it's simply a reminder in regards to uh, the situation that exists so that they can know, you know, because if you if you don't know, then you don't deal with things that you don't know. And um, <clears throat> and if it becomes clear that those who need to know know and they're not acting upon it and and so on, then, OK, well, you can leave them alone. But does that mean that you can't? call an exterminator yourself or get a can of raid and go out there and just you know <clears throat> spray and do that kind of stuff and uh and whatever you, you talk to god and you say okay god what do you want me to do now they're not taking the responsibility and okay so what would you have me to do yeah i understand um it's, the only thing is it's 50 meters up i'm on the third floor <laughs> so um yeah i can't and no balcony the can Pardon? That a no balcony. Oh yes, there's a balcony, but this is the wall um, that sits in the corner beyond the balcony. I can't oh. reach it. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's maybe my it's wasp bedroom spray. window. Pardon? Maybe it's wasp spray because wasp spray sometimes can spray 15, 20 feet. Um, or hang on, what is that? Uh, I got it's like three, no, four, five, five, six meters. <clears throat> but anyways, you know, it's or you or you leave it and you just spray the ones that come inside. Sure. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right. More questions in the chat. Is it wrong to run from the lion in real life? I think God would let me know to run or stand. Um, well, yes, you, uh, you know, I, I, I've thought of these questions as well, you know, and I, I not infrequently think of these, these questions. I'm thinking about this stuff all the time. Um, so yes, what would I do in a situation if there was a bear or if there was a mountain lion or if there was something else of, of that nature, um, we're going to be out in the Northwest in a few weeks and uh, out in God's nature, but God's nature has some really big brown bears that are uh, in that area and everybody carries this, that, or the other thing. And, and of course, the thing I'm running through in my mind is, do I carry anything or do I just, you know, and, and my thought is, well, God's in control. He controls everything. No, I just need to be in a point of uh, a position of openness and say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do now? Where do you want me to go? Do you want me to go there? Do you not want me to go there? And I just want to be about your business. And if I'm about your business, why do I have to worry about 
the animals. I mean, they're his, you know. Um, <clears throat> but if somebody else wants to go walking around with bear spray and other things like that, am I going to, am I going to go, oh, you're not a good Christian? No, no, no that's their business. And that's their responsibility between them and God. And, uh, and their responsibility might not look exactly the same as, as my responsibility to him. And it's not for me to judge. So they can go about and they can do that. And I simply want to know what, what God would have me to do in this situation and following his will. Um, <clears throat> Yes, self-preservation is a delusion. Self-preservation is a result of sinful nature and selfishness. Uh, before sinful nature or after it, there's not going to be any self-preservation, so there's not going to be any fight-or-flight response. That's just a, that's a part of sinful nature. Um, don't we have limited accountability towards others, but ultimate accountability towards God? No. No. We have no accountability to others. We have all accountability to God. He is the creator. He is the owner, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, next week, when we talk about authority and submission, we do have a responsibility to God to submit to his authority that is exercised by somebody else. Right. We do have that. But no, we are not accountable accountable to others. We are accountable to God because he's our creator and he's our owner. But if I take that accountability to God and I acknowledge that and I live in that accountability, then I know that God is with me everywhere and that He that my accountability is not just in the things that I say and do, but even in the things that I think. And so it gets to the very root of the problem and the root of the issue. And if I'm accountable to God and he loves them, then I'm accountable to God for how I relate to them. So it, my accountability to God affects every relationship. And it affects every relationship deeper than any thought of accountability to them because my accountability to them is only in relation to what they're aware of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But my accountability in him, he's aware of everything. So my accountability in him is for everything. Um, I think that question happened partway through the presentation. <laughs> Didn't Daniel and the Hebrew boys seek to save and protect their lives when King Nebuchadnezzar sent forth a degree to kill the wise men because they couldn't tell him his dream and its interpretation? <clears throat> they prayed that God would reveal the dream so that they would not die and the rest of men of Babylon. Um, well, yes, because they had a, a role there. God had brought them there. He had clearly brought them there, and they had a, a, you know, God had a plan to fulfill in their lives. And so they understood that there was still plan to fulfill in their lives, and so they're praying in harmony with God's will that he would carry out that plan through their lives. And But they recognized that their lives belonged to God, not to themselves. And that's what they proved when it came to the fire. They said, King, we don't fear your decree. We don't fear the fire. Our God is able to save us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. <clears throat> Would you say that high emotion and anxiety in any relationship would indicate that we have made the person our source, even unconsciously? Yes. Yes. Um... Absolutely. We are also told the wicked would not want to be in heaven. It would be torture for them because their hearts are in opposition to the law of heaven and their death is merciful. That's true. Um, <clears throat> so as it relates to boundaries, what should Adam have done in the situation with Eve? Um, well, he should have trusted God's verdict in her case. And instead of seeking to save Eve, contrary to God, he would have come to God and said, okay, what do we do now? You see the situation? This is a big situation. And I, I do not want to not have, you know, I, I want to be able to work with her the rest of my life. I, I enjoy this. We're, we're a team, and I don't want this team broken up. 
is there anything that we can do about it? And perhaps there could have been. Because he would have come to save even one, right? So perhaps he would have come and died for one. We don't know. But it, it would have been trusting God. Right. He would have he would have stayed in his own boundaries. He would not have tried to cross over in God's boundaries and then save Eve a different way, uh, you know, his own way and so on. <clears throat> um, is there a benefit to doing hair analysis to determine if the body is carrying toxins, balanced minerals or lack of nutrient, imbalanced min minerals or lack of nutrients? Are these tests reliable and accurate? There is a measure of reliability and accuracy to them. How accurate are they? I cannot say. I can't say. Um, I know that some of them depend upon the types of shampoos or conditioners or other things that you have used because, you know, some of them contain zinc and other min minerals. And if that's on the hair when it's sent in, then that's going to be part of the analysis of things that go through. But when it comes to heavy metals like, you know, mercury and other things like that, maybe it's a bit more reliable. Um, and if you knew that there were certain toxins or other things like that, what would you do about it? Well, you might, um, you know, do things in order to speed up the detoxification process. If it's heavy metals, cilantro and parsley are probably the best herbs for um, chelating. Those, you know, so you eat a lot of cilantro and parsley and maybe even overdo it for a little while. I don't know. Um, drinking lots of water, exercising, sweating, you know, making sure the urinary system and the digestive system and the skin system and the respiratory system, which are all of your elimination organs are all working well and, um, <clears throat> and so on. And, but you got to watch out because, uh, sometimes tests will show up things and then you become worried about stuff and you didn't have to get worried about stuff. So it's something again that you pray and you say, okay, Lord, is this something you want me to do? Another question. I have a question. How do you get out of a relationship when you see your husband ignore, uh, ignore you, don't help you with nothing. Don't see nothing good on you all the time, make you feeling sad, uh, appointing to be uh, the point to be on depression. Okay. All right. So let me read that again. How do you get out of the relationship when you see that your husband ignores you, does not help you, uh, doesn't see anything good in you, all the time is making you sad uh, to the point of depression. That's the question. And uh, and the answer is, uh, the, the solution is not to get out of the relationship. The solution is to change your source. The problem is you have your husband as your source and <clears throat> you're, you're expecting them to be good to you and to be good for you which you need your source to be good to you and to be good for you. But God never intended for your husband to be your source. He intended for himself to be your source. And so it's God that is good to you. He's good for you. He's loving. He's caring. Um, he, God always is paying attention to you, even if your husband is not. God is always helping you, even though your husband is not. God sees everything good in you, even though your husband doesn't see any of it. And God is uh, not leading you to depression, but to courage and to hope and so on. So what you need is not to leave the relationship. What you need is to develop a relationship with God so that you have God as your source and you come to him and you take everything that you need from him. Then when you're satisfied by God and God alone, then you can love your husband and you can care for your husband and you can respect your husband and you can honor your husband and you can do all of that kind of stuff because you're taking all of those things from God. You have them, now you can give them. I'll tell you right now, with this attitude, you don't love him, you don't respect him, 
you don't understand him, you don't honor him, you don't any of that kind of stuff. And he knows it and he feels it. So you're not helping the situation either. Because the moment you complain is the moment you do not have God as your source. Right. When you have God as your source, you don't complain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, I know that's kind of hard, but it's true. That's true. And and so can you ever fix your husband? No, you can't fix your husband. That's between him and God to fix. But you and God, two of you can work on you. So that when your own problems are resolved by the grace of God, then you won't have the same problems with your husband anymore. You will be able to love him. You will be able to respect him. You will be able to honor him. You will be able to do all of that kind of stuff. And he will notice the difference. And when he notices the difference, maybe, I'm not saying it will, but maybe things will begin to change in him so that he's not the same way. Uh, any natural remedies that you can do for bone marrow cancer. Um, <clears throat> but the most importantly, how to get to the issue behind the mind. Um, on our website, npmin, n as in Nancy, p as in Paul, min as in ministry, dot org, there's a home cancer protocol uh, under the articles section that you can download. Also on the YouTube channel, there's uh, there are two presentations called the Mind Cancer Connection, and there's another one calling it called the Bible on Immune, the Bible on Autoimmune Disease. But on autoimmune disease, it's dealing with bone and bone marrow and the issues associated with bone marrow dysfunction. So that's going to give you a lot of places to look. And also the handout will give you natural remedies that you can use to um, work with in bone cancer. Um, boy, lots of questions tonight. Good evening, Brother Mark. What does it mean to be out, to be our brother's sister's keeper, brothers and sister's keeper in the light of what we went over today? So what does it mean to be our brother's and sister's keeper? That means that in Christ, we have an interest for the salvation of others. And we recognize that we are the hands and feet of God, that we are his chosen agencies for reaching other human beings for the purpose of salvation. And so as the hands and feet of God, we take the responsibility of seeking for and working towards the salvation of others. That does not mean that I take responsibility for what they think, what they believe, what they say, and what they do. But it does say that I take the responsibility of taking from God and then giving the truth and so on to others, <clears throat> but not beating them with it, not badgering them with it, not demeaning them with it or anything like that. It's always the truth in love. So the truth in love. So I manifest love towards them. I, I, uh, I not just express in my words, but in my actions. And I seek for their best good. And a loving and a lovable Christian is the greatest argument in behalf of the gospel and in behalf of God. And so as a loving and a lovable Christian, I interact with others for the purpose of their salvation. And that is being a brothers and sister keeper. Um, how do you overcome stress? Stop being God or, or stop trying to be God. That's, uh, it's, it, I know that was a, that was a short answer. Um, <clears throat> stress is when we try to get into God's sphere and control what only he controls because we think the problem is ours and we need to fix it. So we've got to control time and space and circumstances and situations and time and money and and whatever, and we can't control those things, and it doesn't work, and so we fail at fixing the problem, and now we have stress. That's where stress comes from. So what is the solution to stress? The solution to stress is knowing that, one, I am a child of God. I'm not God. 
And as a child of God, God is the one that's in control. He's the owner. He possesses all things. He controls all things. He does so out of a character of love. Uh, he does everything with my best interest in mind. And I can trust him in that. And so now as a child of God, knowing that he is God and he is in control and he's the owner and the resource for everything, now I can relinquish the attempts to try to control all of these different things and leave them in his hands. Now as the steward, I simply go, okay, God, you've got the, it's your problem. It's not my problem anymore. And I'm the steward. So what do you want me to do to cooperate with you? in this problem and fixing this problem. And I don't have any responsibility for the outcome of that or the success of that. I simply have a responsibility for what God asked me to do and doing that. And he's the one that's responsible for the success and the outcome. Uh, in a longer answer, I would say um, it would be good on the YouTube channel to watch the um <clears throat> the last camp meeting, living free, and the presentation's there, and it will give you a lot more in that direction. Next question, how do we come to know or differentiate particular mental issues that cause organs to become affected and, and, and get sick? Um, <clears throat> sorry. That's a good question. Sometimes it comes with repeated exposure, seeing people over and over again, asking questions and finding patterns that may be there. Um, uh, you know, but other than that, it's seeking to understand where is sin and sinful thinking in my own mind? Where am I believing lies? And what lies do I believe? And, uh, and what is still present? Um, <clears throat> and going from there and that that's in the late time that we have um that's what i'm going to answer to that so is that why the scripture says in psalms 51 verse 4 against thee the only have i sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest yes yes because every sin is against god because everyone belongs to god and um and sin is the breaking of his law. Right. Uh, so anything that is done to somebody else, God says, you have done it unto me. And so it is a sin against him, against you. You only have I sinned. Uh, do we need to be cautious? That, uh, this should be the last question. Do we need to be cautious with interactions uh, or receiving things from people who practice witchcraft? Should we fear eating their food or receiving gifts and going to their house, etc.? This is a family member, and I'm questioning if I'm taking uh, it serious enough. These are things I've heard we should be cautious about since finding out about the practice. I did notice a couple of strange demons and sounds where there shouldn't be sounds. Dreams and sounds where there shouldn't be sounds. Woke up out of my sleep. Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, fear or your thoughts can do that to you as well. Um, all right, when it comes to uh, those types of things, um, the the question is, why are you there? Uh, what's the purpose for going? That's a, 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 a big thing, um, you know, from that standpoint. Are you going to, to minister to them? And if you are, are you really actually ministering to them? Or... Are you not? You know, Jesus accepted feasts from all sorts of people, invitations from, he never turned an invitation down when it came to go and eat somewhere. But he didn't just participate in everybody's conversation. He came and he, he, he directed the conversation. He rearranged, you know, he, he was, he became this, he took over the conversation and directed things in a good direction and, and so on. So are you there in order to, um, you know, in order to help them, in order to bless them, in order to be a positive influence in their life? And you can be a positive influence in their life. Well, then go. <clears throat> right. Um, if it's there because you want them to think good of you, because you want them to not be so frustrated or angry with you, or they don't 
you don't want them to think that you're ostracizing them or other things of that nature, well, then they're your source and you're going there to your source, which is in witchcraft and so on and so forth. And that's probably not the best idea. As far as eating their their food, um, you know, receiving gifts, going to their house and all that kind of stuff, I... You know, that was a big <clears throat> that was a big issue back in Paul's time of eating food that was sacrificed to idols and you know, it, does that mean that they're sacrificing their their food to idols and other things like that or they're just in the home? That was a big issue and Paul's personal stance from that standpoint was, well, I don't believe in idols. I don't believe that they're anything. So why do I have a problem eating something that was offered to idols? But if my doing so causes my brethren to fall, then I'd rather not ever, never do it and not cause them to fall. So, you know, from that standpoint, well, uh, I mean, if it was me, well, I wouldn't worry about eating their food and uh, and so on and um, <clears throat> and uh, and whatever. You know, in regards to gifts and other things like that, is it something that I truly need? Is it something that's useful, or is it just a trinket to, to put somewhere and and uh, and whatever from that standpoint? If it's something useful and and I can use it and it can be of use and I can use it for good, well, that's fine. If it's just a trinket to go somewhere, well, do I really need it? The answer is probably no. Um, and uh, and then you would have to decide whether it's best to. Uh, you know, just whether it would be best to say, well, no, and thank you, but, you know, I, I really don't, you know, I really don't need it. Um, <clears throat> or whether it would be best to say thank you, and then you just, you know, it doesn't end up in your house later. Those are things that you and the Lord can work with one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, so we do not want to be presumptuous in going where we know that things are offered to idols, right? Well, I mean, you know, Jesus specifically went to the heathen and uh, and he ministered, uh, you know, amongst them and and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, Jesus said demons were not cast out without prayer and fasting. Actually, I don't think that's what that passage means. Why was it that the demons couldn't be cast out? It's because the disciples were arguing amongst themselves who was going to be the greatest, and they were fussing amongst themselves because they weren't taken up with Jesus up to the Mount of Transfiguration. It was only Peter, James, and John, and the rest of them were left at the base of the mountain, and all of them were griping and 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 so on about that. And because of their griping and so on, they had no connection with God, and they could not cast out that demon. And Jesus says, that only comes out by prayer and fasting. What's that? It's the selfishness. It's the self-seeking. It's the desire to be first. It's the murmuring and complaining and all that kind of stuff. That only comes out by prayer and fasting. Right? <clears throat> and uh, uh, and so on. All right. It's, it's late. Really late. It's almost you know, <clears throat> 45 minutes late. Let's pray. And next week, it'll be authority and submission dear heavenly father thank you so much for your blessings again what a wonderful god you are thank you for being that wonderful god and uh lord help us to be about your business help us to learn how to stay in our sphere of action and to leave other sphere of actions alone and uh and to have that freedom and that joy of just being about the father's business and self control under the Holy Spirit. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.